Currently, the college football playoff stands at four teams chosen by the committee. It is an inherently subjective process because there is no such thing as a purely objective measure for determining who the best teams in college football are, and that is okay. There is some statistical data and other numerical values, such as rankings, that are used in some form of a measuring stick, which incorporates some principles of objective measures, but there is no such thing as a 100% objective ranking in anything. We as humans all have individual experiences and perceptions, so we will naturally bring those presuppositions to any conversation, data, ranking, etc. Subjectivity in some form will always exist, and that is okay in matters that are not concerning objective truth. I just wanted to get that out of the way so it can be addressed up front. A point that I've made before is that rarely in college football will you have more than three truly elite teams in the nation. A fourth team is typically outside of this range by a little bit. Think Notre Dame in 2018, Wisconsin in 2015, Oklahoma in 2019, etc. That fourth team was still much better than most teams from fifth on down, but they still weren't in the top three, like those elite teams. To bolster this point, consider this. The same ratings that determined the BCS championship game have chosen the same four teams as the college football playoff committee every year of the playoffs. So it would seem that the playoffs itself is not as big as of a difference as people think. If you were mad at the BCS, technically you should be mad at the playoffs too because the BCS and the playoffs have chosen the same four teams every year. From a pure standpoint of healthy competition and top tier play, why would you add 2 to 12 more significantly inferior teams to the format? The only explanation that would make sense to me in some way is if you say that you just want to see more football games in general. I'm definitely still against that, though, because it serves little to no benefit to the players themselves, which is my number one priority, as you'll see throughout this video, and can be potentially harmful to them in more ways than one. By the end of the playoffs, teams are really banged up, including Alabama this year. Go look at the injury report after the game. Now think about how all of the other teams in the playoffs will be in similar situations. By the time the national championship gets here, you'll be looking at two teams with very depleted rosters. Not only does that mean a decrease in quality of the games, but it also means we are jeopardizing the future of these players with little to no benefit to them. You're going to hate that I'm now going to tell you that depleted roster games are still going to favor the teams with better resources in recruiting classes like in Alabama or Clemson or Ohio State. And I think you're getting the point, et cetera, et cetera, because the depth of their roster is more talented than the teams who don't have their resources. More importantly, I don't want to see early round players get a significant injury playing an extra game against a team they will probably beat in a blowout. So ultimately it serves no purpose. The only reason I will start to think about accepting this is if there is some type of compensation for the player, an insurance benefit for the player, or both, something like that. There's too much risk for the only benefit being marginal fan enjoyment. Some may say the NCAA Division II has a bigger playoff, so why can't Division I? This comparison between Division I and Division II doesn't work. This is simply due to the Division II players not being in the same position and status as D1 players. The majority of D2 players are not fighting for an NFL future. For most of them, this will be the last game that they ever play. Their risk is vastly lower than the D1 athletes in terms of you know, moving on and profiting from football. They still have the risk of injury in the college football playoffs. Also, with the dominance displayed at the top of D2, their expanded playoff doesn't seem to be necessary either considering how one to two teams seem to win it every year in D2 as well, even with all of those teams participating. There are literal dynasties dominating D2, even with that large playoff format that they have. That leads to this third point. Expanding the playoffs does not inherently change the landscape of college football. I think some people believe that expanding the playoffs will somehow lead to the dismantling of the powers leading college football, Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State, etc. That's not going to happen. Washington, Oregon, and Wisconsin have all been in the playoffs, and it hasn't done much for them since that time. All of those teams in the D2 playoffs that aren't winning aren't receiving much benefit either. Fans are simply consent with their team making it to the playoffs. 
And recruits don't really care if a team just goes to the playoff one time. Recruits didn't flock to Washington and Oregon because they saw them in the playoffs. That's not the way it works. Recruits go to where programs are having success and the coaches know how to recruit. And they see some form of future there at that program. A friend of mine and others argue this type of point. And I quote, if you have the same teams every single year, certain fan bases, certain regions start to tune out and stop watching. It is not good for overall landscape of college football. That is why expansion is very necessary. End the quote. So part of my response to this is this. I'm not convinced that people are actively tuning out. People are always in and out of college football dependent on the success of their teams. If their team is doing better, they and more people will watch. Most people watch their team exclusively anyway, so the overall landscape of college football is hardly on their radar. Fans watch their team because they are fans of that team. They will watch and support regardless of playoff appearances. USC fans are still diehard, and they haven't had any postseason prospects for a very long while now. Michigan fans are the same way. Both of the Oregon Pac-12 schools have very dedicated fan bases. Nebraska doesn't have trouble keeping their fans. <laughs> These people haven't stopped watching college football because Alabama and Clemson are in the playoffs every year. If people continue to watch college football every year while they are actively hating the BCS system, then they will continue to watch with the 14 college football playoff. All in all, even with the arguments for expansion considered, I don't value them over the risk that are coming to the best players with the most to lose by playing more games. Unless the players in the playoffs are compensated in some manner, I cannot justify expanding the playoffs. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video and consider my argument here. The question is, do you agree with me? Or if you don't agree with me, tell me why in the comment section below. Also, this topic just comes up every year, so I figure we might as well get a head start on it anyway. But if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the channel and turn on the notifications in the YouTube app and in your phone. <laughs> but you also can click on this video to the left to see a video from my channel that the YouTube algorithm believes is most relevant to you. Or you can click on the video to the right to see the last video that I made. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. And for those who made it here at the end, a random bonus question. Uh, what do you want to see me cover this year in college football?